Go ahead, Margaret. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Margaret Hayden. I'm with the Forest Service, the Tonto National Forest. I'm a large project archaeologist, and I assist Arizona Preservation Foundation with uh, putting on these monthly webinars. If you aren't familiar with these webinars, I, I encourage you to take a look at the Arizona Preservation Foundation website. Uh, we um, these are will be recorded. They are all recorded, and we um, put the links there. So please feel free to take a look at past webinars. This webinar is certainly unique um, in that uh, we are going to be talking about neon, and um, I'm sure those of you from Arizona are certainly very well aware of our neon signs. Normally, at this point, uh, we would have someone from the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office uh, uh, introduce everyone. Um, unfortunately, they are all uh, have battling a, a, a little um, flu bug that's going through the staff. So unfortunately, you're going to be stuck with me this morning. Uh, my cohort, uh, Donna Reiners, who usually does this with me, is also has a conflict this morning. She'll be joining us a little bit later in the, in the session. Um, so I'm going to start off real quickly giving you an introduction to our speakers and reading a little of their bio. My apologies up front if uh, it's a little... Um, choppy. Uh, I live in Williams and my internet is not the best. So I will uh, first introduce uh, Vic Lindoff, who uh, provided us with that wonderful intro video. Um, Vic uh, has been energetically involved in heritage sustainability in for more, more than five decades, uh, writing and working with preservation groups and history museums. He is president of the Mesa Preservation Foundation that, that since 2010 has been actively saving, rescuing, restoring um, orphan um, historic neon signs that would otherwise be lost to landfills. To date, the M MPF has saved nearly two dozen signs. In addition to his other activities, Vic is, po is a popular presenter of the Arizona Humanities Council AZ uh, Speaks Forum. He frequently lectures and regularly speaks at the New Frontiers of, for Lifelong Learning program and in other groups. Vic has produced eight antique, antiques uh, related books uh, for Dover Publication, um, co author The Antique Key 2, a survey of East Valley mid century architecture, and co authored A History of the Buckhorn Baths, co authored with Ron Peters. He has served on numerous boards, Arizona Museum of Natural History, Mesa Historical Museum, Tempe History Society, and Tempe Historic Preservation Foundation, etc. He's varied uh, achievements have been recognized by the Arizona Historical Society, Al Moreto Award, the State Historic Preservation Office, Arizona Preservation Foundation, Governor's Heritage Preservation Award, and the City of Mesa Historic Preservation Award, for Outstanding Achievement Lifetime Contributions. Our second speaker, Marge Jantz. Uh, Marge is a historic preservationist, art advocate, and sign enthusiast who lived in Casa, uh, Casa Grande for the past 25 years. She was the Main Street Executive Director for eight and a half years, a City Historic Preservation Commissioner for 24 years, and champion of the Casa Grande Neon Sign Park and is currently the board supervisor for Grande Central Station, uh, Inc., a nonprofit organization whose purpose is preserving Casa Grande historic signs, local sign landmarks, and long-term preservation of its neon sign park. In 2018, she was the first in Casa Grande to receive a DAR, Daughters of American Revolution, Historic Preservation Recognition <laughs> Reward. And in 2019, Chance received the, 20, the Casa Grande Chamber of Commerce Community Advocate and Volunteer Service Award. Chance began saving Casa Grande signs in 2004 and was recognized as the champion of the Casa Grande Neon uh, Sign Park in 2019 and champion of the recent installation of the Windmill Roadside Attraction next to the Neon Sign Park. Our final speaker, uh, Jude Cook. 
Jude is owner of Cook and Company Sign Makers and founder of um, Ignite uh, Sign Art Museum in Tucson, Arizona. Jude grew up with an um, with an artist mother, and after high school, completed a two year graphic arts program in Waterloo, Iowa. He began his career as a technical illustrator for an engineer company while learning sign painting on the side. In 1978. He opened Cook's Sign Company in Cedar Falls, Iowa, and in 1983, moved the business to Tucson, Arizona. In 2009, Jude joined a committee that was formed to write an amendment to the city of Tucson Sign Court Code in order to preserve historic signs. Since then, his company has restored 25 signs in the Tucson community, helped restore and install the signs at the Casa Grande ne Neon Park, um, one in Silver City, New Mexico, and all the signs at Ignite, at Ignite Sign Art Museum. Now, uh, Vic, you wanted to take it away? Sure. Thank you very much, Margaret. Actually, we're out of time with all of that expansive uh, uh, introductions. Um, so if there's any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, we've got to wrap up in uh, 20 seconds. All right. Um, <laughs> I think you're going to find this an interesting uh, webinar because we're going to do a number first to just discuss a little bit about neon and what it is. I'm not sure if everybody understands that. You certainly can recognize a neon sign when you see it, but it's a little more complicated than that. And if you're in a community or in an area where there are yeah. historic signs. Somebody's got an open mic, I think. Better than most. So, yeah, I'll just be in here. We can uh, we can start tearing braces off and uh, go get your back and we'll get started. All right, what do you want me to start doing? Where's your back? Connie, can you check and see Mike. where we've got an open? Yeah, I need to find out. You might be able to mute everybody as the host. Okay, so um, if you're in a community that, that has neon and would like to see it preserved, uh, there's a number of ways of going about that. And uh, we've got um, two people who have had different experiences in doing that. And so they're going to talk about what it takes from their perspective to um, to first save neon, then to restore it, and finally get it back on public display. But first, maybe just a, a little bit of background um, about neon. Uh, the idea of energizing a gas uh, with electricity in a in a vacuum tube has been studied in one way or another for about a a, a century and a half, but it really didn't uh, begin to take form until near the, the 20th century. Uh, science was early on looking at uh, what electricity was. You know, we think of Ben Franklin and his kite experiment. Electricity was something very novel. And so in various applications where electricity might be used, people were just seeing how electricity affects various um, aspects of, of their research. But we've got to get more towards the, um, uh, the, the 20th century. Um, and that's the other thing. People think that neon and maybe neon signs uh, are much older than they really are. Uh, it is a relatively modern application um, uh, to the use of neon. And neon in itself comes from Greek. It means new. Uh, and that was the name that was given to it when it was discovered in 1898 by two British chemists, Sir William Ramsey and Morris Travers uh, in London. And he discovered that um, when a chilled sample of air uh, became a liquid and then warmed the liquid and captured the gases as they boiled off, 
that's how we began to separate neon. Neon's actually an abundant gas in the universe, but it's it's very difficult and challenging to um, to isolate itself. Um, so gases uh, like nitrogen and oxygen and argon had already been identified, um, but there they knew there were more uh, gases and had to figure out a way to uh, uh, to isolate them and see what they did. Um, the gas neon was uh, identified in June of 1898. And when it was put into a vacuum tube and energized with electricity, it produced a, a brilliant red orange color. Um, and that really shocked the two chemists. Um, they weren't sure what they were having, but uh, it was an exciting discovery. Uh, Travers later wrote the blaze of crimson light from the tube told its own story and was a sight to dwell upon and never forget. Um, a second gas was also reported along with neon uh, and having the approximate density as argon. These are all what we call noble gases. And I've got a, okay. And... I've got to figure out how to change these slides while we're while we're talking. Um, so these there are a, a, a number of noble gases, and they're essentially inert um, uh, gases. They don't undergo chemical reactions uh, when put under various uh, conditions. And here you're just seeing some of the the uh, tubes that uh, shapes that can be made uh, and then the gas is put in. This is uh, William Ramsey uh, and this was his partner in making this discovery. Uh, their only contribution was this discovery of neon and uh, how it was affected by electricity. But it's also uh, part of uh, several elements Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, um, oganesson, which I'm not familiar with. These are all colorless, odorless, tasteless, and non-flammable uh, gases. And there, there is uh, the chemical makeup of, of neon. What isn't always... Um, understood is that we we'll actually get to seeing the color of um, neon signs. Each gas um, gives off its own color signature. And so when you see various colors in a tube, it reflects different gases. And then also the tubes can be lined um, uh, with various other materials that will also alter uh, the colors. Neon. Collectively, we call all of that uh, neon. But when you're actually looking at a sign, uh, you'll you'll see uh, that. Well, you won't see it, but within those tubes are are various gases. The real expert uh, here is Jude Cook, who actually works with and restores neon. So Jude, when you're there, if I'm going off base, uh, feel free to, to, to come in and, and, um, and offer uh, the, the corrections. So um, this excited uh, uh, a lot of people and uh, it came at a time when not long after Edison's uh, incandescent bulb, which is an inefficient way of producing electricity. Uh, it also produces a lot of heat. Edison had trouble with filaments uh, lasting and people were looking for a way to create light uh, without, without all of that heat. And it was all really called, they, they were looking for light without heat. Then comes along a fellow by the name of Georges Claude, um, who was a, French um, 
chemist and physicist. And he began to get excited about neon. And he really um, tried to figure what would be a good practical application of neon. And he came up with the idea of making, well, I'm not sure he originally thought about signs, but at least producing light. Here you see some photographs showing uh, what it takes to first isolate the neon and then begin uh, to make the signs. He patented his discovery um, in 1912 um, in France. And three years later um, on this application, uh, he, he patented it in the United States in 1915. And this is what would start everything. Um, so there were a couple of expositions in Paris and in Europe and uh, some times in New York where neon was first uh, shown to the public. And uh, it was absolutely captivating. People could not believe what they were, what they were seeing. Uh, very brilliant light, no heat uh, generated. And uh, so in Paris, they began to produce some signs. Uh, Claude gets his patent in the United States. The first sign, we're not really sure. Uh, there seems to be some consensus that the first sign was produced in 1923 um, for a Packard dealership in Los Angeles. And these signs uh, at the time cost about $1,250 a piece, which today would translate to over $17,000. Um, you've got to take on uh, good authority or best guess that it was this dealership in, in Los Angeles. Um, but other cities were, were showing interest. And so there might have been a sign in Chicago or, or New York um, that came later. So here we were talking earlier about uh, the various colors that uh, these individual gases produce. And this is a pretty good representative uh, illustration. These are the basic colors. If you line the tube uh, with a phosphorescent uh, powder, you can also alter uh, the color of the neon. So there are some of the colors that, that neon uh, can be produced in. And remember when we're saying neon, we're talking about this whole family of, of gases. If you wonder what the first sign looked like uh, in LA, there it is. Uh, and not only was it a tremendous accomplishment to produce this neon uh, light, uh, but as you'll see, you have to have many, many disciplines in order to successfully make a sign. Uh, from designing the sign, that's an artist, uh, to engineering, uh, how it is put together. Uh, people need to work in the field of welding and sheet metal. And then also uh, you've got to be an expert in glass to be able to bend this tube successfully. And then a chemist to understand the interaction of the various gases and how they uh, color. But anyway, neon really began to take off in the uh, in the 1920s. We we had the first Packard sign about 1923, but there wasn't a, a federal highway system until 1927, when it was realized that highways were managed by private entities, by states. Um, there wasn't a cohesive network of roadways. And so uh, a national act was passed that created our federal highway system, coast to coast highways, things of that sort. This was 
in my view, the catalyst that really got neon going. Uh, incandescent wasn't terribly bright. It wasn't um, effective uh, in, in terms of its lifespan. It was a high energy use. But what it did was produce, uh, uh, neon produced a brilliant light that could be seen for many miles. And when cars were coming down the highway uh, early on, that might have been 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, they would have had plenty of notice uh, of some activity. And that's when roadside businesses began to grow up, lodging, food, tourist stops, things of, of that sort. And of course, when we think of neon, we think of New York City and Times Square. Um, I'm not sure, and I'd like to research the history myself of how neon really came to Times Square, but we realize today uh, it's the central activity for signage. Neon is being replaced in Times Square by LED, and oh, there are some uh, 3D uh, type signs that are absolutely incredible where an image seems to come out of the sign. Uh, you don't need glasses. It, it, it's really a remarkable thing. Another uh, place where neon took off and was a, a, a perfect location for this use of signage uh, way out in the isolated desert was Las Vegas. And uh, Fremont Street is where Vegas began. That's in the downtown area. The buildings were very close to each other, as you can see in this particular photograph. Um, so it just was um, a, a colossus of light and design. Uh, people were, and still are, are mesmerized by these, uh, these types of uh, signs, very big signs. But eventually it kind of took over um, the landscape. And for those that have been around a while, you might remember an article from uh, Life magazine in 1970. Uh, this shows Tucson, uh, Arizona, uh, Speedway Boulevard, which was a very wide roadway with lots of activity going on on either side. Um, it's misleading. Uh, the, the, the caption says, look down, look down that loathsome road. Uh, yes, there were a lot of signs. There was a lot of clutter, but this was taken with a very high powered uh, telephoto lens and was collapsing over a mile of street uh, in order to get this photo. But this came at a time um, when uh, Lady Bird Johnson had a campaign to clean up the roadways and signage and the clutter. And this is when some cities began to look at neon in a negative way and start um, creating ordinances that wouldn't allow it. This is a similar photograph uh, of Main, Main Street in Mesa and uh, you can see in the background uh, the diving lady, which I'll talk about uh, next. Uh, and then uh, a sign, it, that's, that's over two miles of road that, that's covering uh, in that one telephoto photo. Um, in 1955, a couple of brothers from Kansas came and opened uh, a motel. Uh, there was plenty of land available. <laughs> Excuse me, the valley was unique in that it had a confluence of four major federal highways that all all coalesced on, on one road, 60, 70, 80, and, and 89. So um, you had people coming in from the east and from the west, um, and this was a perfect opportunity for roadside businesses. So these two brothers opened the Starlight Motel, and it was typical of the era with uh, a little garage next to each unit for covered parking. Uh, but it, what it lacked was a swimming pool, which was becoming a major amenity. So in 1960, 
they built a pool uh, that you see in, in uh, these two uh, photographs. Uh, but then they felt that in order to really publicize the fact that they had a pool, they ought to have a, a sign to go with it. Uh, the sign on the left was is the original sign. It is still there today, Starlight Motel. Uh, but they wanted something that really stood out. And so they worked with a local sign maker, Paul Millett, who didn't design it, but he executed this sign. And this became one of the most spectacular signs on Main Street. Uh, each letter in the word motel is six and a half feet high and about three and a half feet wide. Um, the diving lady figures uh, the top one is nine feet and the others are about 15 feet. <laughs> and they were on a pole uh, over 60 feet high. And there was an animation that uh, I can show you here where the figures dived in sequence into uh, a pool of neon water. And this became the icon for East Mesa, for people coming into the uh, into the community. Um, and so it performed very well for 50 years uh, until 2010 in October, there was a microburst, which actually um, was so powerful that it blew the sign over. And uh, keep an eye on this ladder. I'll explain this uh, in a minute, but what happened is the sign fell into the parking lot of uh, this motel and was absolutely uh, destroyed. The owner of the hotel, motel, was uh, it had gone through uh, several hands, um, decided that he just needed to get it out of his driveway. And so uh, began calling around to see if he could find a salvage yard that would give him $300 to pick it up and haul it away. The Mesa Preservation Foundation, which was just organizing, learned of this fall immediately after it happened and knew that if it didn't get involved, the sign would disappear. And it would be one of the, the great tragedies in, uh, in neon in the, the Valley of the Sun. So it worked with the motel owner and got the motel owner to sign over the title to the sign to the foundation, which then gave the foundation the ability to work directly with the city and contractors uh, to get it restored. And I have to tell you, and I know Jude can attest to this too, uh, signs of this era were not executed the way that they are today. Uh, they weren't really sealed up. And so uh, these were ideal spots for birds to nest, romance, do whatever, uh, but they became pretty disgusting on the inside. Also, um, you can see here uh, rust on the, uh, on the sign. Uh, the fall did its damage, but the sign, even though it was functioning, uh, needed a lot of work and it had to be literally rebuilt. And so, what the foundation did. We uh, worked closely to make sure that as much original material was saved as, as possible. And, but it meant stripping it down to its basic elements, uh, reinforcing the interior of the sign, and then beginning to work um, all over again uh, to rebuild it. And whoops, I don't think I can go back. <laughs> um, but you saw just briefly some of the work being done on the sign. And as it was done, um, we had to find a place to to put these individuals, no storage um, when it was being restored. So we worked with shopping centers and actually got them to agree to let us place these signs in vacant store windows with interpretive signage to explain their history, that sort of thing. We had a fundraiser, uh, dinner with the diving lady um, in one of those stores. Um, 
but it also showed our naivete. We were thinking that maybe we could do this in three in three months, get it all restored. It took three and a half years and one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars in order to uh, restore uh, this sign. But it got done, and the the attempt was to make it look just like it did when before it fell. So the colors were not necessarily the bright original colors. They were more of the faded colors so that people would, wouldn't would know if they hadn't learned of what happened that the sign ever had any issues. So there you see the signs, one of the signs in a store window with uh, interpretive panels. And people were very impressed by being able to see that sign um, up close uh, and realize just how big uh, it, it actually was. Oh, there's the original sign. And uh, we did get some shots. We had to have a, a new pole fabricated that you see on, on the right of the uh, photograph. Uh, then the letters had to be installed one by one, and finally uh, the animated figures until we had a complete sign again. We thought we ought to have a ceremony rededicating the lighting of this sign, and we were pleased, we would have been pleased if 50 or 100 people came. We asked the mayor to come and ceremoniously flip a switch to activate the sign, and his staff said, eh, it's not going to be a big deal. Go flip the switch, give a two-minute speech, go home for dinner. Uh, the estimate is over a 1,000 people came. Uh, they couldn't all fit on the motel property. They were in the median uh, on the roadway, the sidewalk across uh, the, the roadway, and even in a parking lot uh, nearby to witness this. And the mayor was there for about four hours and delighted because there was a, uh, all the media was there. This was a, a big sensation. I wanna talk about just briefly uh, the Buckhorn Baths, uh, which is home to another iconic sign. Uh, this was started by Ted and Alice Sliger in 1936. The baths began in 1939, but Ted was a very, um, had a very active interest in neon. Originally, it was uh, just a gas station. And in the late 40s, they tore out the station and built this monumental uh, sign. And not only did they build a huge sign for the Buckhorn Baths, but all the buildings were outlined in neon tubing. And then there were dozens of uh, hand-painted and neon signs uh, throughout the property. Uh, this kept uh, some of the sign makers really very busy uh, over the years. And it still functions. Uh, you can see in these photographs, the, the colors are off. Some of the tubing is broken, but it, it actually still lights up and it stops traffic if, uh, if and when it's lit. We've done a couple of neon tours uh, bus tours, and this is a group that came and were absolutely delighted to be part of a tour where that sign was uh, illuminated. Glenn Gayette is a famous uh, designer. He did not make signs, but he designed all of these signs and many more uh, that you see uh, around the Phoenix area. Uh, this shows a bit of what it takes to produce a neon sign, I know uh, that Jude will, will get into it. It is an extraordinary art form that we really never want to see die. Paul Millet did sign design, but he also uh, was a neon artist himself, and you can see him at work. Um, uh, in Early in his career, he worked in the Guerrero Sign Lindsay Company, uh, or Lindsay Guerrero. In those early years, everybody kind of worked together. I, I wouldn't say that it was a real competitive uh, environment. These are some of the signs that he produced. Uh, these guys, too, 
um, if they were around today, would absolutely be uh, candidates for Cirque du Soleil. Uh, they do things without harnesses. Uh, back in the day, they were they were doing incredible acrobatics. I mentioned on the diving lady, that ladder, if you remember at the very top, and when the sign fell, we couldn't figure out why that ladder was there. It just didn't make any sense because it didn't go anywhere. And we were told that Paul Millett, uh, who installed the sign, didn't have a crane high enough to reach the top of the sign. So in order to do the installation and the work that needed to be done, he fabricated this ladder, welded it on the pole, and just left it afterward because nobody would see it uh, when you're driving down the road at 45 or 50 miles an hour. Another major sign was the Kiva sign. This is one of the earliest neon signs uh, uh, along the roadway in Mesa. Um, regrettably, this uh, motel was just demolished, but the Mesa Preservation Foundation was able to salvage the sign and it will go back on public display, uh, hopefully uh, in, in not too long a time. Um, it had even a, a little pot here that this was neon that, uh, that, that said vacancy. Um, a side note is the rock uh, that you see at the corner of the building, and we were not able to get this saved, uh, but had all of these petroglyphs on it um, because originally the fellow that started the Kiva was selling uh, Indian uh, goods in, in a store, and then he built a motel later. And he, he had this done to attract tourists uh, it isn't authentic, but it looks like a salesman sample of petroglyphs that uh, that you'd find around. This is one of the only neon signs, early signs, that still uh, remain in Tempe. Tempe created an ordinance uh, in the 1990s uh, that encouraged property owners to remove their sign and the city would replace it with what we call a cemetery sign, those low monument signs. And Jerry said, hell no, we're not gonna do that. And so their sign is still standing today. Watson's Flowers, uh, another remarkable uh, sign, uh, very complicated. Um, it had some issues and fell against the building uh, but didn't damage the sign. The owners didn't have the money to restore it. So they put it on a metal pallet and left it there for five years. Eventually they donated it to the foundation. Uh, we're estimating probably 200,000 to, to restore it. But um, we think that this will be back on public display by the, uh, by the end of the year. So that's one uh, that we have actually saved. This is our little uh, neon storage boneyard, if you will, of signs that would otherwise have gone to a landfill, but we were able uh, as a foundation to save and we'll be restoring them uh, and putting them back on display. At least a half a dozen will be on display by the end of uh, 2024 in, uh, in downtown Mesa. Now, there are examples of how various places deal with these neon signs. Uh, Edmonton, Canada uh, found a novel way to collect this historic neon, restore it, and put it on in a display that in itself is quite artistic. Um, I'm not sure what the building is, but they built a metal frame that you can see attached it to the building and that provided uh, the mounting elements for the various signs as they were restored. At the ground level are some uh, interpretive plaques so people know where these signs uh, were originally located. This is what it looks like uh, at night. Uh, 
then there are parks uh, where signs can be aggregated uh, in open spaces. Uh, Tucson was uh, really a leader in that area. Um, putting some of the neon is at Pima College. Um, people worked with uh, the city of Tucson and Neon Mile, that they call it, uh, was the area where most of the early motels were as people came into Tucson. And so those signs uh, have been placed. We're going to get to the Casa Grande sign park. This is a very, very novel um, and innovative way to display neon, uh, but also how this was achieved is, is the real story and Marge will talk about this in, in just a couple of minutes. There are sometimes unique locations where signs can be placed. This is called Neon Alley in Pueblo, Colorado. These signs belong to one man. Um, I don't know the legal aspects of how he worked with uh, these various building owners, but he started mounting uh, the signs in a, a very ordinary uh, alley. As you can see here, you've got dumpsters. It's not particularly attractive, but at night, these signs just absolutely stand out. And this little space has now become a community gathering place. There are concerts that are held there. There are events uh, that are held in this space, all because of the attraction of, of the neon. And in Mesa, uh, the Mesa got one of the, well, the second federal post office in the Valley of the Sun in 1936. Um, it has just been restored. It's called the Post today uh, as a community space. The city owns it. And behind it, where the postal trucks would be, the um, uh, that space is going to be converted into what they're calling a, a neon garden. It will be a, a, a space where concerts can be held, various activities, but ringed around the property are the neon signs. There's Watson's Flowers to the left, uh, a very early Dairy Queen sign, uh, Bill Johnson's Big Apple, uh, a Ford sign. Uh, all of these we're hoping will be on display by the end of the year. Then there are museums uh, around the country. Um, there are many, well, not, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. And we owe in Arizona uh, a great debt of gratitude to Jude Cook, who will be speaking in a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, who really on his own dime uh, decided to create uh, a museum for signs that, that he was collecting. And I should point out, and I, I believe Marge will agree to that, Jude will agree to that, people often think that those of us who are involved with putting historic neon in public display want these signs that were greedy and as a foundation, we're always encouraging property owners to save the signs where they are. That's where they were meant to be. They explained what that business uh, was. Uh, but if there's no choice and it's going to go to a landfill uh, like the, the Kiva Motel sign, then obviously uh, we will take them and work to, to get them restored. And uh, that's how Jude has... has uh, conducted his business. He'll show you more of his museum in just a moment, but uh, it's absolutely uh, spectacular. This is a somewhat dated sign. and We owe a lot of uh, debt to Deborah Jane Seltzer, who has got uh, a website called Roadside Architecture. She travels all over the country photographing neon and um, and identifying places, but you can see here uh, just how many places there are where you can experience uh, neon. And in each community, neon is different. Um, uh, no two signs are, are alike. So 
Um, just some final thoughts about this. Um, these are some things that people have said about NEON and uh, recognize what it means uh, to have restored NEON in, in your community. Once it was beloved early in the 20th century, then it was reviled at, at mid-century, and now we're really recognizing it as a true art form. The, the bottom line is that I don't think we're going to see gigantic neon signs like Las Vegas or uh, elsewhere anymore. LED can replace it at a much less expensive cost. But now people are, are producing neon for museums uh, as, as an art form. So uh, we are indebted to them for keeping it alive. We're indebted to people like Jude Cook, who understands the art of neon and uh, works to, to restore it. And then people like Marge, um, who can find the money to get them back on uh, public display. So that's um, basically the story of, of Neon, and I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this presentation today. And um, now I want to introduce Marge. Uh, Marge has a, a very unique story, um, and I am extraordinarily jealous of her uh, uh, and her ability uh, to rouse people and energize them, as she'll tell you, uh, to see a project like she accomplished, see that actually happen. So Marge, take it away. First, you have to uh, turn on your, uh... there you go. Okay, I'm, I'm now unmuted and, um... I'm going to share a screen to get going. Yep. And then I'm going to share again. And I'm there. Okay. Um, and may, okay. So may I go to full screen? And have I think a, uh, everybody can see it already. You don't need to do anything else. Okay. Okay. So here we go. For those of you that have not been to Costa Brande, um, it kind of, it started uh, quite a few years ago for me. Uh, I was the uh, Casa Grande Main Street director, and the first sign that I saved with the help of a friend at the History Museum was the Hershey Motel, and the second was the Goddard Chew, and the third was the Sunset Court. So the story on the Sunset Court is it took an entire year begging the owner who lived up in Colorado we could have the sign and finally he agreed to it he said oh you i'll let you in all you need is a trailer and a crane and by the end of the week i had both so down came the sign and yes as uh, vic said it was full of rust and bird dew and it went off to uh, the gentleman that's standing on the ground there it went off to his farm for about three or four years and then it finally got into indoor storage but it was a mess. And um, Jude was our hero uh, because I uh, went to Tucson. He said it would really be helpful if we could just use that as a one-sided sign because he had to totally remake it. And it was from 1941. And so the uh, that lit sign on the right is the night that um, we um, had the dedication in 2017, and we had the family that grew up in that uh, Sunset Court, three generations of Osbournes were there at the lighting ceremony. Um, and then uh, within a year, we had the mural. So one thing leads to another. I mean, um, yes, I've had the passion, I've had the bug, but uh, it does take a village. And you can see in this uh, how many steps there were to making um, something happen. So at the beginning, we had this uh, had a dream to have a neon park because I had collected a number of signs. And I was over at the city one day and the uh, planning director said, 
<gasps> next you're going to be wanting a park. And I'm like, a park? What a novel thought. So um, I went to the Main Street director at that time and I said, I have an idea. I know where it needs to be. I need you because you're 501c3 and we've got to raise a lot of money. And she said, I love the idea. I'll do it on one condition. What's that? And it's like, you need to go to the owners of the property and uh, get their permission. I did. They said yes. And here we are. We've got a neon sign park on public um on private property. And uh, we would have never had that park had it not been for the uh, Casa Grande Valley newspapers agreeing to letting us use their property. So, uh -oh, clicker is not working. Um, Try clicking on the image itself. On the just on the slide, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. For the thank you. Um, I do have a problem with technology. So uh, this is our park for those of you that have not been to Casa Grande, and that's what it looked like when it first opened. So we're about five years into it. We'll have our fifth year anniversary uh, this April. So um, it's um, in the. Uh, art and culture district. And in the background uh, on the right, you see that stone building, that's our history museum. And we've got our um, our women's club, which is now a little theater and our uh, art museum all uh, in that unique little area. So we call this an, our outdoor neon uh, museum. Uh, in the park, we have uh, 13 signs, all but one are from Casa Grande. Oh, there's one out on the boulevard that you'll see in a moment. Uh, and then our domino is that uh, sunset court that you just saw. And it is on a building. Remember, it was one-sided and we really hadn't even started the whole park idea. Uh, so um, it's on a building with the mural just right next to the park. Um, oh, good, it worked. Um, so this is the first sign that was collected in 2004, and it looks pretty good in that picture, but I think that picture was um, taken a few years earlier by an uh, unknown photographer, but we happened to find that in the archives. So guys, it was in the sun for 10 years, about 12 years. Then uh, it went to storage, big deal, because that picture in the center is what it looked like when Jude came down to look at it. It was a mess. And the picture on the right is what it looked like after it ended up in the park. So the uh, sign is from 1953. And um, the other thing that we ended up with was that little waiver that's to the right hand side of the sign. And uh, Jude was restoring the sign. Uh, contacted me one day and said, I had a, uh, well, actually, I guess he sent me a picture of it. It was that waiver. And I'm like, I want one. I was on a postcard that a customer had brought into his shop. And uh, so, yes, we got one and we call him Paul. And I had just seen one a few months earlier when I was at a sign conference in Cincinnati. And um, so he didn't have a lot to go from because there aren't uh, like building instructions, but he did an amazing job. The, let's see, click on, yay. Uh, this is the Goddard Shoe. It's our only enamel uh, sign in the park, uh, which was really impressed Tob, uh, Todd uh, Swarmstead, uh, who owns the largest neon museum um, in the country, which is in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've been fortunate enough to be there at a sign conference. So a uh, story on Goddard was um, in 2006, um, uh, again at Main Street, I went to the property owner because the sign kind of intrigued me. And even though it was all painted gray, I had no idea what Goddard meant at the time. And I just said, Irwin, I'm gonna have a crane down town next week. Could I have that sign off of your building? 
And he said, yes, imagine that. So I guess um, sometimes I get, you just need to ask. And uh, I did it so innocently and I got the sign. And then it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with it? And again, uh, the friend over at the History Museum said, oh, I'm the facilities manager over there. Um, I can, we can store it. And they ended up with it for about 12 years. So uh, the next photo, it, the sign is flying flying to its new pole in the park. And uh, I guess uh, Rena, the previous uh, Main Street director, and I just kind of like that flying through the air uh, to its new home. And um, the porcelain, as uh, Jude tells me, and that the Anto did do, that in the Southwest, porcelain is kind of um, special if you have one, so we feel really special. And the only thing that really needed to do, be done on this sign and uh, was done by um, Larry Graham out in Mesa um, and installed by uh, Jude uh, is somebody had um, cut the neck off the goose and he had to uh, make a new uh, head for the goose. So then we have uh, collaboration and partnerships uh, as we were putting the park together. And that would include that we received four signs from the Museum of Casa Grande. And these two that are being pictured in this slide are from 1950. Uh, and Arizona Edison was the predecessor to Arizona Public Service. So when in 1950, uh, when the Arizona uh, Public Service, it, the sign was like brand new, and then the Arizona Public Service purchased Arizona Edison. They gave the sign to the city. The city used it for several years, and then when they were done with it, they gave it to the museum. It was in pretty bad shape. Probably it was looked worse than even what this picture shows uh, when it went off uh, to Tucson in uh, March of 2018. But on the right-hand side is a daytime version of what it looks like now. And it's up on that. You can see in the background, it's up on that facade uh, in the Neon Park. The Valley National Bank uh, sign, uh, that one was actually in the day. It was over the uh, night deposit box. So it was in really good condition, but it was just like a big piece of plastic. And it wasn't very... Um, the depth wasn't um, wasn't really there. And I'm like saying to Jude, Ooh, is that really going to be OK? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just build, build a box for it. So he built a box. And on the right hand side, you can see what it looks like. And again, it's on that same facade in the park. And uh, obviously, everybody that comes in, you know, especially people that are a little bit older, they all remember Valley National Bank. So uh, that's a real uh, popular one, even though it's basically pretty plain. The um, next one we have here is kind of a fun story. And it was the very last sign that went in the park. It was not um, available at the time the park opened, but we were ready for it. We had the pole in and the plaque in. Uh, but um, the sign and the first, uh, like the newspaper article on the upper left is in 1956 when the sign first went up. And it was the uh, first uh, truck stop in Casa Grande to have a cafe. And it was on the old Tucson Highway, which is now um, Jimmy Kerr Boulevard. And then the sign in the center, uh, that is what it looked like when the uh, sign came down um, to go off to Tucson. And um, the sign on the bottom left is the daytime view at the moment. And in the day, it was a red, red sign uh, background. And the sign on the right was a wonderful uh, night view that Roger Naylor actually took when he was here a few, few months ago. So uh, Ralph's Cafe um, is might be my favorite, you know, it's like it was the last sign saved. Um, and then, then there's Horseshoe Mattel and, you know, it was the first sign saved. So I'm really not quite sure, but that doesn't make any difference. So the next one is the tools. And what happened there 
the sign was originally done in uh, 1976, uh, and uh, we've repurposed it in a most interesting way. And in 2014, uh, Harbor Freight came to town and that sign was existing on the property. And I wanted the whole thing because I just thought it was kind of an interesting with all those little bubbles. But the only thing they would allow us to have was the tools at the top. And uh, so we, I took them and uh, actually they delivered them uh, to the museum who was pretty famous for storing things for us. And uh, then when I started to have uh, people come, uh, sign makers come to look at the park, I showed them that sign. And then I'd say, as we walk across the street, I want you to look at that monument sign that's right on on Florence Boulevard that will be approaching the park. And uh, let me know if you see anything at all that could go in that open slot there. And Jude was the only one that had a vision to uh, pop those um, little, they were all like aluminum frames um, into that uh, area. And there we are. So we needed four and he ended up with <laughs> one of those beaten up things. And then the uh, sign on the right was taken at the time the park opened. It just, that one happened to be because we got two different marquees going. Uh, and um, it's a night view uh, that you can see from the Florence Boulevard. The Next one, we uh, Casa Grande was uh, kind of a pioneer in um, having uh, our sign surveyed, and we did that in 2016, and we were about ready to lose that Dairy Queen sign that was from about 1950, and it had that wonderful cone popping out of the top of it. And at the time, we had one, and Topeka, Kansas had one. And I was told later by someone that lived in Topeka that theirs had to come down. Uh, the Brazier went, board went up in the 70s, so and it's not as old as the sign. But um, we were going to lose it because, as probably a lot of you know, uh, Dairy Queen Corporate was having a new image and they were going to grill and chill. And those uh, Dairy Queen lips, as they call them, um, had to go. And uh, we were lucky enough with the help of the owner, uh, Jeff Trendler up in Tempe, uh, that um, we, we were able to save the sign. And when I say we, that was the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, we have those uh, these other signs. We've got 11 at the moment. And that's one thing that Grande Central is doing is we uh, are partnering with the city. Uh, I started when I was on the uh, Historic Preservation Commission and continue to try to uh, get some more local landmarks going uh, that were really all identified uh, with that survey. And if um, Doug Town is on um, as a watcher today, he was involved in that uh, as the consulting historian. So we were grateful that we had it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the desert sands there at the, on the upper, uh, that um, is a local business and that man loves that sign. So it's really exciting exciting when the property owner can get excited. As the last gentleman, uh, the last sign that went in, uh, the uh, uh, painted sign, it's a corrugated uh, metal, it's a painted sign, and um, we're getting ready for another roadside attraction over there because the owner's going to uh, make some uh, pour a pad, put a really cool truck uh, on it, uh, change out his fence and so on and so forth. So it's gonna be fun. Uh, to see that area brought back to life. Um, you know, we don't know the uh, manufacturer of most of our signs. Uh, they, I do have the one on that in this particular photo was a a Sign Company up in the valley uh, that did the uh, Desert Sand sign. So as we were saving in 2016, um, the Dairy Queen sign, uh, we were not able to save the cones. And so I got permission to get those cones. And I had those cones in my garage for about a year and a half before they went into the park. But um, we did save the cones and we just left them the way they are, drive through and exit. We've got them in two different areas in the park. Um, you know, uh, 
I've got a little section here on saved, and this is one that we did save, and we are so grateful. Then we have oh, this one hurts. It's been uh, it's been since 2016, and it's still it's just painful for me. Um, we thought we had that silver bullet sign saved, uh, and I again I say we the historic preservation, um, the planner at the city. I mean we thought we had everything covered, and lo and behold. Um, someone came rolling through town, saw the sign, went into a, a, an adjoining business, asking what the story was because the building was in foreclosure. And they said, oh, um, the bank owns it. And they went to the bank. And after telling us decisions could only be made out of Nebraska, they took $2,000 for that sign and it was gone. And by the time we got over there, all it was, um, it would go posted on Facebook. And then uh, Laura and I ran over there and it was gone. Um, it took a while for it to get to Ankeny, Iowa, however. And that's another story for another day. But the uh, gentleman that was going to take it to Ankeny uh, took it to a pawn shop. And then someone else came in in Apache Junction and uh, bought the pink slip. And then uh, long story made short, the sheriff's department uh, went out and got the sign. And eventually it got, we did contact Ankeny and told them what was going on and assisted them in the recovery of that sign. And guess what, folks? This is what it looks like in Ankeny. And that picture was taken by a friend of mine uh, who had an aunt in Des Moines and drove up to Ankeny and uh, took the photo went inside and told them that she was there to uh, bring that sign back to Casa Grande. Now, they have promised that if anything ever happens to that uh, restaurant and bar, that they will return it to pa Casa Grande, but I'm not gonna hold my breath on that one. Our next one is our endangered. And, uh, and I, I kind of picked this one because it's, got high, it's high profile, it's a mid-century modern, Yes, it's in that Antico II uh, book that Vic mentioned earlier that he uh, co-authored. And it was uh, Bob Frankenberger's most favorite building in Casa Grande. Um, it's mid-century modern and it is an awesome building. Uh, what had happened is the owner who had restored it to that picture that you see in the upper left, he went bankrupt. Then it was in a trust for years and they just left the building um, get bad and the sign worse. And now it's uh, in the, um, we've got a brand new owner in town and they have a lot of other things on their mind other than that sign. So it is endangered. Um, then uh, next thing we have there, and I was given permission to give a little hint on this one. Uh, this Don Market sign is from 1941, and it uh, has been in storage since, as you see on the slide, uh, for three years. And um, the little hint is it may reappear uh, in Casa Grande, may get restored and reappear in the downtown. So kind of look out for that one. Uh, that's a little sneak preview on Don Market. Then what can happen after you have um, a magnificent um, uh, outdoor museum like we have? Um, the chamber um, back in 2020, right after the park opened, they changed and uh, of course, and that sign on the right, it, that was a whole COVID thing. But uh, they picked up that cast, uh, had marketing people come in. And uh, of course they picked up on the neon in the community and that's what they're using to this day. In fact, they've just put a brand new sign out and sign uh, in front of the, um, the Casa Grande uh, Commerce and Tourism Office. And, um, and so they're using, uh, using the, the ad to brand our community, which is wonderful. And then getting to the end, um, we had a uh, something interesting happened. No, it's not a sign, but um, we've got a sign coming. Um, a windmill, 30-foot um, windmill. 
uh, Stover Manufacturing and Engineering uh, Company, a Samson oil right. Uh, it was donated by the Poor family. And this uh, Tom Poor was the one that uh, put me onto the um, uh, Horseshoe Motel sign. Uh, he's the one that uh, made it possible to store the Goddard sign. And he passed about uh, a year and a half ago. But before he did, his brother had donated the windmill. And it was like, okay, well, lo and behold, it did take two years to get that windmill up. And that did take um, a village. Uh, we had a lot of help with that. So the poor family helped and uh, we had a significant amount of um, contractors and small business owners helping uh, with that project. We ended up with metal art on the wall. Uh, kind of carrying through with the theme, uh, farm theme um, and used a local uh, metal artist for all of that. And then we got artifacts from the farm. So we've got the farm hand pump, uh, became friends with um, Eddie at the um, uh, Windmill Museum in Lubbock, Texas and got information after giving him all of the numbers off of these pieces that is to about how old they were. And the windmill is between from the 20s to 1942. And the farm hand pump is probably from the 30s. And then we ended up with the bucket and one of Tom's little road runners. So uh, we're creating um, quite a little roadside attraction over there. And before I give you the final piece on the roadside attraction, then the our Arts and uh, Culture Commission uh, ran a contest and they were um, painting APS utility boxes. And that one happens to be just at the other end of the parking lot from the windmill. And the gentleman that painted that box um, did win first place. So um, he was excited to be by the sign park and the windmill. And we were excited to have that box painted down there. Um, so the final piece, and it will be, this is just another one of those little hints because I'm not going to show any pictures that at the other end of the building where those cows are, uh, there's a blank wall and there's going to be a crop duster there. So hopefully you will get down and, if, and probably three or four months we'll have that crop duster. But guess what? We're going to have in neon lights at the top of this wonderful 12 by 18 metal structure. We're going to have Casa Grande in neon and it's gonna be exactly like the neon that we've got on the facade in the park. So it's gonna tie the whole, whole thing together. And we are excited. And picture is uh, my final slide. Um, and it's uh, a little suite that we have right there at the neon sign park. And it started out to be uh, something for people to remember that the uh, central school was on that property uh, from 1914 until it was demoed in 1974. And um, it's just the uh, owner of the property, specifically Kara uh, Cooper, she really wanted the community to remember that the central school was there. So we are mem memorializing central school. And then it's like, oh, we were here because of the railroad. Let's get some railroad things in there. Oh, our Highway 84 was like Northern Arizona's Route 66. So let's get some of that in there. And then Main Street um, gave us the um, the awards that um, that have been uh, won uh, for the park. Uh, so that's all exciting. And then of course you see Paul the Waver there on the wall. So I'm hoping and I'm inviting as many of you that would like to come to <laughs> Casperande and see the park. Um, and this is my information and it's also in the chat, but I only live uh, about three minutes away. So if you were to contact me, I would be, our uh, suite is open on special, during special events. So it doesn't have regular hours. I would appreciate a phone call and I'd be happy to show you around both in the suite and the park and give you uh, that exciting information. And finally, uh, these are, I had one photo in the slide from each of those individuals and I was uh, happy to have their help. So there you are, you have just had a 
quick view of the neon sign park in Casa Grande. Uh, Vic, are there any questions that you may have about the contest? Because it's been almost five years and I have a feeling that most people know how that all came together. Well, I, I'm not sure that, that they do. I will, I, if you, we'll take questions at the very end and you okay. can put them in Perfect. the chat. Uh, but also I noticed in the chat, um, uh, the website address should have, it should be Grande. It says just Grand Central Station. Oh, shame, shame, shame. So, so uh, yes, the, it is Casa Grande. We'll correct that and put it up. Okay. Uh, just really quick before we go to Jude. Uh, one question is, it's very odd. How did you get interested in neon in the first place? <laughs> you know, it was, and it is a passion. Um, it's, you know, it was once I saved that first sign, it was almost, it just got to, that got to be contagious. It was like, it was almost the thrill of the hunt. And, uh, and basically, um, when the, um, <laughs> gentleman came up from Dairy Queen because I was looking that there, oh, I didn't mention that the, the Dairy Queen lips that we have in the park is from Holbrook. It's the only sign that we have that's from out of town. And the only reason why I wanted it was because we had the two cones in the park. And then it had a crack in it because when they took it down in Holbrook, they didn't really care because they knew they were going to throw it away. And so it had a crack in it. And I thought, oh, maybe I can find a, a bat. And long story made short, um, when the division manager came up from Southern uh, Arizona, and he happened to be in town the day I called, so go figure. Um, he said, Marge, you're reliving your childhood. And you know, I had never thought about it, but you know, when all of those signs are along the highway is when we were doing road trips in the car. And yeah, they're exciting. And then I joined the, um, the SCA, which is a sign organization, and I and I go to their conferences, and I'm going to the one in Nashville in September. So it's just like it gets contagious. It's just like it's thrilling. It's exciting. Um, yeah. Anytime I yeah. see neon anywhere, it's just exciting. It takes two things. One, uh, you alluded to a village. Um, none of this happens alone. But what yeah. what is needed initially is somebody who can motivate and inspire and get the community involved and be that leader in Mar That's what Marge has done. And I don't think people maybe really know, because I, I believe we have some out-of-state folks, uh, you needed a lot of money to get this project going. And how you obtained it was unique. And just real briefly, can you kind of summarize how, how you made that happen? Okay, so that was that ended up being a Main Street deal, but how it became that was I had the idea. There was this wonderful contest that came about, you know, just a few months after we had made our up our mind that we were going to have to start raising money. We raised that money for the Sunset Court sign with a big fundraiser, and then it's like, oh, it's going to be years, but we're going to get that part. And lo and behold, a few months later, along came this American Express. National Main Street and uh, National Geographic. And they were going to give away over $2 million across the country. Um, they had a contest that was going to have 25 cities. And lo and behold, we were going to be one of them because, you know, American Express has a big presence up in Phoenix. And, um, and the local um, preservation office in Phoenix knew we had this project. And so they kind of considered us a suburb of Phoenix. We're 50 miles away. But at any rate, we were excited. And really, Main Street just had to sign the paperwork, and we were in. And it was a voting contest. So there were 25 cities across the country, and you had to vote. And we came in second. I mean, this little town of about 50,000 at the time, we came in second in the country. And they were great big, huge towns. I mean, it was Pittsburgh and Hollywood and Oklahoma City and Cincinnati. But I happened to be at one of those SCA sign conferences at the time that we just started the vote. So it began there in Cincinnati. And I got a lot of people at the conference voting for us. And of course, you could do five votes a day, five votes a day, every day for 35 days. 
And yes, we came in second in the country. We got 144,000. However, uh, by January um, of 20, we already had an additional $82,000 into the project. Plus we had the, the land that we didn't have to pay for. So like, that's why I said in the beginning, we would have never had that park had we not been given, you know, basically given the opportunity to have have it on the newspaper's land. Well, it's an it's a terrific story, and um, uh, your ability to to work all that through is remarkable, and that that should be the real message. If you want to end your uh, screen share, I'm I want to leave plenty of time for Jude. I, I will, and um, you know, Rena at Main Street, she was a pro with the media. And my friends and I, we were feet on the street. And it, it, it again, it took the village. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marge. And um, now for the everyman, from the man who can uh, make a sign, can restore a sign, and make a museum, uh, all in one human being is just absolutely uh, remarkable in itself. So. Uh, let me, with great pleasure, introduce you to Jude Cook, and his museum is called Ignite uh, in Tucson. Jude? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. I, thank, you for, thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. I thought that I would start with some of the things that we've run into. Um, if, you, if you're going to try to save stuff in your own community, you really need to start looking at what the sign code says. And our sign code really was detrimental to signs. And, and conservatively, we probably lost hundreds of signs from when our new code was instituted after that ugliest street in America thing in Life magazine. It took Tucson Historic Preservation in, in around 2009 to come up with a, uh, the concept to modify the code which gave us the ability to take a sign down, designate it historic and reinstall it. And that's been key in what we've turned. And we wrote, a, we wrote what constitutes a pretty good amendment. It's got some little quirks in it, but I think it's worth looking at. What we have done in Tucson, and Tucson actually was resistant to tearing down everything. And we're lucky we managed to keep the inventory we have. I, we've done, we've done, I personally have done I think it's 26 restorations in Tucson. And we've done, some of them were designated historic, some were signs that we could restore without actually having to go through the process. So we've done a lot of stuff that's still in place, which gives us a dynamic that you don't have if you let them all get away. You know, we've got the Neon Park at Pima College. We've got a sign in the public library downtown. I, you know, one of the tricks with reusing an old sign because it isn't always appropriate for the business that's in it. The poster child for our progress down here was the Pueblo Hotel sign, which had a diving girl, nothing like the one you guys have up there, but it was, it was charming. And we managed to get that one through the process. These attorneys owned it and we left it as the Pueblo Hotel. And we adaptably reused one panel that said refrigerated and were able to put Picaretta and Davis on that particular part of the sign. So that's the adaptive reuse that, that is built into the code. And another sign we did in Tucson was what was Riley's Mortuary. And the sign was still up and a developer bought it and they put in a pizza restaurant and they call it Risley's. And my wife always says it's pizza to, pizza to die for. I've got a couple of okay, a couple of other things we're doing. We haven't we haven't achieved it yet, but we have two signs here in Tucson that are tagged for possible reinst reinstallation out in the in the community. One is the Tiki Motel, which was on Oracle, which was one of the driving routes, and then this relatively large Mister Quick Hamburger sign, and those might end up on a property that's on the driving route. Um, I'm gonna to touch on mostly restoration stuff that we've done at the museum. A couple of things that I've tried to be really careful of is 
is resisting retrofitting a neon sign with LED. Uh, you know, it's the easy way out. And if it saves the sign, maybe that's an option. But LEDs will last you maybe 10 years. I've got neon on signs that's 70 years old. It's got no comparison. So if you can, if you can do the project and do it right, do it with neon. The second thing that I do is I don't ever use vinyl on these signs. And I suggest you can do it. You don't use vinyl if possible. If you have no other way to do it, again, it's still better to save the sign than to let it go away. What I've found is that paint, though it doesn't initially hold up as well as vinyl, ages much more gracefully than vinyl. When vinyl dies, it starts cracking and peeling. So what I was going to do is show you, I'll give you a little background. Ignite opened five years ago. We just celebrated our fifth anniversary. Um, let's see what we've got. This is an inside shot of the warehouse part of the museum. And there's signs in here that are virtually all things that were destined for the landfill. And we've been fortunate in the things that have, you know, things that have materialized that I never thought were coming. You know, I got the 76 ball in the KFC bucket. I didn't even know they existed and they were sitting in a yard out here in Tucson. And the guy that had them called me up, want to know if I wanted them. I'm going to touch on some of the signs that we've saved. This is a sign that had reached the point that it had all gone to what we call sign brown, as you see in the picture on the right. We got a call on a Sunday morning from a guy that wanted to know what an old neon sign was worth. And I got on the phone and chatted with them. And I said, you know, I'll drive over and take a look at it. The sign in the left photo you can see is when it was in place, it had been hit by a truck. The guy that called me was tasked with basically getting it rid of it. I offered him money for it, said I'd come back, pick it up on Monday, and we brought it into the shop. So one of the hardest things we run into is trying to get back and find the historic background of what the sign actually had for color and color of neon. Well, there was enough neon on here that we made a pretty good guess on what the cut, we could determine what several of the colors were. And there was enough of the basic sign to see the design. We actually found a postcard and the postcard concurred what I thought by just doing a little bit of sanding on the sign. The top and the bottom panels were black. The body of the sign was red. And I knew that it said motel because I could actually see the ghosts of the letterings underneath the paint. This is when we were in the process of restoring it. I beat out some of the dents. Um, we got it repainted. I took patterns off of it. And you can see the progress in the right photo. And the next photo is the sign lighted. You know, there's rust in the bottom lower hand corner, but this sign I'm probably going to keep inside. I think that just shows, you know, history of what the sign's gone through. That was a low spot, probably full of pigeon nests. It rotted out and that's what happens. Uh, this sign, and this is one of the things I do allow myself to do, the oval where the cactus was, we did not have a good photo of. We still don't have a good photo of. What we did there was we recreated a cactus and actually that is actually digitally printed and applied to, to plastic. If we ever get a photo of what that cactus truly looked like, we'll go back and go through the process of repairing it. Um, the light behind the cactus was actually neon. It was destroyed. And I went ahead and put LEDs in behind to light that. And I consider that an acceptable use because it's not visible. Uh, and this has got a mix of old glass and new glass on it. On the El Saguaro, the EL and the ARO is original, but the SAHU had to be repaired because they, they replaced because they were gone. Uh, let me move on to the next one here. The grill, this was called a couple of things over the years. It was originally in, put in, it was originally opened in downtown Tucson in the mid forties. And it went through several different renditions over the years. It was called the stag grill for a while. The top of the grill looks a little blank. Well, that's because there used to be the sign up above that said stag. It closed in 2011. And the guy that had it at that point took the sign and 
stored it in his yard, and I knew that he had it. Well, a couple of years ago, he called me up and said, are you interested in the grill sign? And I said, of course. Uh, we connected. I picked it up. And on this one, because it's going to be outside and it was deteriorating as bad as it was, we went ahead and I'll back up. We went ahead, repainted this, rewired this. I didn't change it. Got the flasher to go. And the next sign is another sign that we saved. This was a this was called Rincon Market. At one point, it was Rincon Food Market. Um, it had a large clock on the left side. Uh, they went out of business, closed up, and a new a new guy moved in and renamed the place Flora's Market, which fortunately he put up a neon sign with exposed neon to replace this. And in the process, he kept the word market but didn't want the word Rincon. So what we've done is we've taken the grill and the Rincon and put them up on store facades that we have built in the backyard of the museum. This next sign, this was a restaurant that was open in Tucson when I moved there in 1983. Uh, this is not the original sign. This is a sign that went up in about 2000. In between 1983 and when this sign was done, the place closed and was two other restaurant concepts and I'm guessing the original owner reopened and they put it up as Sammy Angle House and what this said was Sammy Angle Place. What we did here was we cleaned it up, we repainted it like I said and we got it relit and hung back up on the wall. I, you know, it just, I, they deserve to be, they deserve to be preserved and to the best of our knowledge, this is the colors that we, we found on it. Um, those are just some of the issues that we find when we're going through and doing restoration. If anybody's got any questions, please jump in. Thank you. Okay, we, we can open up to, uh, uh, to questions if you want to put them into the uh, chat. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. We can now all be on the screen. Um, talk to us, uh, Jude, a little bit about uh, what it takes to uh, open a, a sign museum. Uh, the Diving Lady, when we started with that restoration, we had no idea that it was going to cost for one sign about 125000 um, uh, Some of that came in in kind, but that was, that was the total cost. Marge was talking about the expenses incurred for, for various signs. So uh, we reached out to the community and said, if you value these signs, would you be willing to invest in them? And that's how we were able to raise money. But as I understand it, you, you footed the whole thing <laughs> on your own. And uh, that's absolutely remarkable. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit just about what it takes to, to open a museum like yours, which so, by the way is, is remarkable. Uh, there isn't anything like it uh, in the area and I haven't been down for a while. Now you're building this uh, facade out in your back lot, which I think is incredible. So uh, it, you're expanding out from the interior museum. It's, it's, it, it really helps to have a wife that supports your ideas. Um, it, it, you know, we bought, we bought the building in 2017, um, mortgaged my house again. And, and, you know, we, we were handling it pretty well. You know, I had a lot of signs to begin with. I, I, I've just been blessed with the amount of stuff that's been given to us. And you're right. You, your project with a diving girl up there was a heck of a way to start. You know, I've done, I haven't done, I've only done one job that even comes close to that. And it's not one of my own, you know, it helps when you have your own sign company and you have a neon shop and you have the guys that know how to do this stuff. So that's big. It's daunting. I mean, you know, you buy a 7,000 square foot building and go, okay, now what are you going to do? 
I, you know, we just started at the front door, started setting up displays and got the inside of the building at least to the point where we could open in October of 2018. And then since then we have added, I look at pictures from back then and wonder what I was thinking. We have added so much stuff inside and then we've done the facades that we have actually are, it's actually a street with two sets of facades that gives us room for about 11 signs and we call that Argon Alley and we've done some fundraising there, but for the most part, I, you know, I've funded it outright. We've gotten one small grant. Um, you know, you, you got to have, you got to have the tenacity of Marge to pull off stuff like this because it's a lot of work. You know, there's, there's endless things that they throw up at you. Um, you know, we've been, we've been lucky with, you know, we're getting decent traffic and, you know, we do other, we do classes to help fundraise, you know, to keep the place up and running. But, you know, it, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a really fun adventure. Vic. The, I would ask this to both of you, and it's something that you hear all the time. And I've thought about it in, in our own instance with the Mesa Preservation Foundation. Knowing what you do today, and this is to both you and Marge, would you do it again? Marge, go ahead. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, was, it was a lot of work, but yes, yes, yes. I mean, when, when, when people walk into the park, it's just so serene and I don't know, it's just got a special feel to it. And then recently I've been down there a couple of times and there are teenagers in there that go down to text. I mean, we've got some, some benches down there and they go down there to text. I mean, go figure. I guess it's a, a quiet, safe place. The lights are on every night until 11, seven days a week. I don't know. Yes, I'd do it again. Jude? So it's, it's interesting that you get people that come in with such low expectations. And it's easy to impress them at that point. Um, I don't know what they're anticipating, but, uh, you know, we get such positive feedback, uh, you know, just like Marge does at the, at the park in Casa Grande. It's been, you know, it's just fun. We get to meet so many cool people, you know, people that are excited about it. People had no idea that they were going to be excited about it. Um, it's, I, I would definitely do it again. And if I had more money, it'd even be better. <laughs> I think we would all, all agree to that. Uh, there's also one thing for for anyone th that's considering um, doing something like what Jude has done, or the Mesa Preservation Foundation, or Marge. Uh, when when we talk to policymakers, um, you have to take a, a different approach. For example, when the diving lady sign fell in 2010. I'm not sure that anybody uh, in leadership positions in Mesa knew what a neon sign was. Uh, it just was not on their radar at all. We had the ability uh, to have a good relationship with the media. So uh, at no cost, we were able to generate a huge amount of publicity. And as a result of that, that's what brought the neon to the attention of the city. Uh, if, if you Google diving lady, uh, you'll see references all around the country. Uh, this was a sign that was, was nationally known. And this took us towards an approach of economics. Uh, I'm involved uh, with, with historic preservation and one of the leading preservationists in the country is a fellow by the name of Donovan Ripkema, R-Y-P-K-E-M-A. And when he talks to conferences, he makes it clear that he's not a preservationist. And people wonder why they're spending $5,000 to get him to public to speak to them. And he says, I'm not a preservationist. He says, I'm an economist. And that has changed my thinking considerably. Uh, so I don't care whether the policymakers like neon or not, but if I can conven can convince them that there is an economic benefit to preservation, 
of neon signs, for example, that they understand. And now in the city of Mesa, as a result of the diving lady incident, and I think she was the catalyst that got everybody going uh, in this state, um, Mesa is taking credit for it. And that's fine with us. They have it on their uh, documents. The mayor at his last election, who wasn't even on the council when the sign was restored, did a t-shirt with the diving lady. Uh, <laughs> they understand that by restoring that sign, uh, this has generated heritage tourism. People come to Mesa just to see the sign. The same thing in Casa Grande. Um, people now, many people with all due respect, Marge, and you know that, why do I want to go to Casa Grande? What's down there? It's just out in the middle of the desert. Well, now there's a reason. They have this fabulous sign park. Let's go down and see it. Oh, well, you want to go get something to eat? Uh, you want to do something else? It is generating an economic benefit to Casa Grande, and it's enhancing um, the city as a cultural attraction. In Jude's case, um, the museum is his, but that translates to an economic benefit to Tucson. People will go out of their way. And I have to tell you, Jude, um, every time I put uh, your place in my GPS, it complains of a migraine headache. Um, <laughs> you really want me to find out where that place is? It's very hard to find, folks, but it is worth it is worth visiting. And when you go there, um, you're generating revenue not only for for Jude and his museum, but for the community. Um, and that's often lost on policymakers. So if you are approaching your mayor and council or whomever uh, for some help, uh, take the approach of economics. And I think that will work more successfully than arguing why you should be saving old neon signs. Uh, it, it certainly worked for us. And I know that's uh, that's the message that Donovan Ripkema uh, provides uh, all the time. It's really, um, uh, uh, you've got to find the right strategies. And even with Mesa, we were also careful. We didn't ever go to the city expecting them to be the sole source of revenue. But we have gone to them and said, essentially a city is a business and an enterprise and you should be a partner. Um, if we can raise this amount of money from the private sector, will you match it from the public sector as a business partner? Instead of going and saying, we need a million dollars, give us a million. Uh, we're willing to uh, take a risk at our own fundraising to, to get the city uh, to be involved. Uh, and I don't know, Marge, maybe you can talk uh, about how it was uh, working with Casa Grande. Because uh, Jude alluded to it, you've got regulations and, and um, all sorts of things. Uh, you just can't do this on your own. You need the help of the public sector. Am I on? Yep. Yes. Um, you know, the, uh, we're very fortunate. We've got a, um, a great preservation um, ordinance. Uh, we had 100% cooperation with the city on the, you know, having the neon. Um, it, it was a good thing. Uh, I mean, that is so important to have all of those elements in place. It makes the job a lot easier. So while some things might have been a challenge, uh, working with the city on the project um, came across very smoothly. That's that's great. And it's now become a point of pride for Casa Grande. Uh, yes. Jude, you, you've handled it from all of the angles because not only when you're 
restoring your own signs for a museum, you're also doing it commercially. So you have to deal with city rules and regulations. How has that, um, uh, can you talk to that experience yeah. at all? Well, I mean, yeah. little things that have helped um, was like with the, our little diving girl, uh, the attorneys, one of the two partners passed away and they sold the building. And because of the way the code amendment was written, we have the ability to do an adaptive re reuse. And as I mentioned, we had Picaret, we had the attorney's name, firm name on the sign in that one panel that used to say refrigerated. And that was about the smoothest thing I've ever done. They, I went down, said the Avita Hair Institute bought it. They wanted to change the panel that said Picaret to do Avita Hair. I had the permit in four or five days. That was good. The process is a little clunky. Um, Anytime you designate it historic, you've got to go through a historic review and a neighborhood review, and you'll spend two to three months getting through the process. But as of yet, with the exception of one sign, it's been flawless. I've gotten through everything I've wanted to do. I have, I've, made, I've made one or two minor changes to our presentation. And the only thing I had to do on one was put up, putting a sign up in the barrio and the neighborhood said there wasn't any projecting signs in the neighborhood. And I ended up spending three hours at the Arizona History Museum going through archives and taking pictures. I came back 25 photos of signs that were projecting in the barrio. And, I, you know, it, it, these people had only lived there since probably 1980 forward. And all of the commercial districts were gone. But these photos I had, I ended up with 25 photos. I got back to the meeting. And I said, well, I did have some success. And I started laying out photos about 10 in. They said, we've seen enough. And I said, oh, you really got to see these. Um, you know, it's, it's worked fairly well. We've had a few. Uh, the Alcon Mall sign, which was a 1960 sign, did not have neon on it. But design-wise, it was major mid-century and deserved to be restored. And that one, we ended up... We had to go for what the code amendment calls a transitional sign, which was, it didn't have neon, but it had, it had the shape and the architectural feature or the design features that tied it into mid-century. And we got approval from the historic review, but we also had to go to Marin Council and present it there. But other than the time it took, it went through just like it should have. Well, we owe a lot to uh, Arizona owes a lot to Tucson because Tucson really became the leader in recognizing the real value of neon. Uh, like every city uh, in after the 60s uh, began to create ordinances that didn't permit neon. Um, it was considered to be uh, disreputable it was used by disreputable places i guess that's the best way to put it um and was an eyesore uh but gradually uh in the private sector there began to be a recognition of what what neon was all about um but the sign the in in tempe for example in the 90s the city went to every property owner, uh, not only those that had neon, but said, your sign is out of compliance because now we have size measurements, we have all sorts of things, height measurements. And we can tell you that if you ever need to repair that sign, take it down, then uh, we're not gonna give you a permit to put it back up. Now we'll make you a deal if you let us take it down for you, we'll give you this cemetery sign, here lies, Mm. Whataburger instead of you know the big expansive signs um and tucson uh and i know that took several years of of hard work to create an ordinance uh that is now used as a a model elsewhere in the state a question has been asked about uh getting copies of the ordinance uh for tucson mesa uh, a few years ago enacted an, an ordinance essentially based on Tucson. There are quirks to all of these. Tempe has done the same thing. And I regret that um, 
uh, I can't cite those ordinances to you directly, but if you go to um, the cities uh, that you want to look at, Tucson or Mesa or, or Tempe or wherever, uh, within their uh, municipal code and zoning, you'll find a section uh, for signage. Um, and what Tucson has done and uh, Mesa followed was that uh, if you have a historic sign on your property, but it's no longer relevant to your business, it doesn't account, uh, it doesn't uh, detract from the square footage that your business sign would allow. So it encourage you as you as a property owner, a business owner to keep that historic sign. And then you can put up a new sign uh, that's relative to your business. Um, uh, it, it's much better when the signs stay where they are. In preservation, we talk about context and context means uh, how is this building placed? How is this sign placed? How does it affect uh, the rest of the business? And when you move it to somewhere else, you lose that history and context. Um, but it's certainly better than letting them go uh, to a landfill. Um, so I think that uh, you'll find some really uh, positive things if you restore neon. Uh, you're also going to run into challenges. Everybody that does it said, has said, and you know, we were naive. We thought three months and then three and a half years went by before we had our sign back up. Um, it, it, it can be a real challenge, but the rewards are, are really great. I think before we wrap up, because we're getting close to um, uh, our two hour time frame. I want to introduce uh, Donna Reiner, uh, who has joined us, and she is the uh, treasurer of the Arizona Preservation Foundation and has been coordinator of these webinars. Uh, to say a few words, and uh, I want to thank Donna on behalf of Marge and Jude um, for giving us the time to talk about one of our favorite subjects, and that's NEA. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Vic and thank Marge you. and Jude. And I also have to thank Margaret, who stood in for me earlier uh, in the program because I was teaching a class someplace else. Bad scheduling on my part. But I want to thank all of you who attended. And in case you haven't seen some of the comments, this program is recorded. And it will be, as soon as we clean up uh, you know, parts that aren't necessary, we will post it and we will send you a notification of that, uh, that it's been posted and where. The other thing is that we do have several new webinars coming up. So stay tuned and watching uh, postings on either the Arizona Preservation Foundation Facebook page. Uh, and I think they're gonna be really exciting. Uh, Donna, uh... Because there's this interest in, in the code, I know Jude is trying to find it. Uh, if we can get the links to that, is there a place that we can post it uh, on the foundation um, Actually, website if, or page? If, if, or... You send that, if you send that to me, I, I've got the emails of everybody who attended and I can send that out. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll get those up there. I know that they're online, but uh, cities don't always make them easy to find. That is true, that is true. So from our standpoint, uh, let me uh, thank Marge and congratulate her. And I have told her many, many times if she wants to move out of that little sagebrush backwater <laughs> little town and come to a great city like Mesa and give us her energy, uh, we can have 25 neon signs up tomorrow. Just an offer, Marge. Okay. And good. <laughs> Jude, I've got signs for you when you're ready to open your business up in uh, in Phoenix. We really need you up here. So uh, congratulations to both of you for all of the work uh, that you've done. And certainly to those that are watching, uh, please take time to go to the Casa Grand Park and to uh, Ignite Museum in, in Tucson. Thank you much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Donna. And thanks to everybody that was watching today. You made it fun. Thank you.